Welcome to the Cost of Smoking and the Psychology and Physiology of Quitting Conference Call. My name is Rebecca, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Amy Lentz. Amy, you may begin. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Cost of Smoking and Psychology and Physiology of Quitting. Again, my name is Amy Lenz. I'm a CHQC, and I will be your facilitator today. I want to take just a few moments to share a little bit about BHQC. Um, we are a private, nonprofit health quality consulting company that serves as a quality innovation network, quality improvement organization for Maryland and Virginia. BHQC consultants come from a wide range of healthcare backgrounds. Um, our team includes physician practice managers, nurses, nursing home administrators, home health nurses, health information managers, and health communicators. We also serve as a practice transformation network for the state of Virginia. As mentioned, uh, today's session will be recorded, and it will be posted in the HQC's online community. If you're not currently a member of our online community, please join us by visiting a link listed at the top of the slide or posted in the chat box. Additionally, um, I want to make sure that you're aware that today's session is part one of a three-part webinar series, Plan and Coordination with American Cancer Society. Please be sure to sign up for our next webinar that will be on June 16th, where we'll learn more about resources from the American Cancer Society, as well as information about Maryland and Virginia's Quit Now program. Again, you can register by clicking on the link um, in your chat box. And finally, during today's session, we ask that you're, you be attentive and engaged, open, collaborative, and actionable. At any time, if you have questions during today's session, feel, please feel free to enter them in the chat box, which is located in the right-hand corner of your screen. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity to verbally ask questions. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome our featured speaker, Dr. Rasmus. Dr. Westmoss is the Director of Tobacco Control Research in the Behavioral Research Center at the American Cancer Society. His research focuses on factors that individually and interactively influence smokers' motivation to quit and their success in quitting. These include social factors, psychological factors, biological influences, and envi environmental factors. Dr. Westmoss uses his results to develop strategies that increase the demand for and effectiveness of smoking cessation interventions particularly those that use internet and email to provide tailored personalized cessation treatment. He is also involved in adapting cessation interventions for populations that experience disparities in the prevalence and effects of tobacco use. Dr. Westman, it is a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the session over to you. Thank you, Amy. So what I will talk today, um, uh, my talk will be divided into two sections. I'll talk about the health and the economic cost of smoking, and then some, and then I'll move on to the physiology and psychology of quitting. Um, and I will end up, you know, uh, touching a bit on some of the interventions that um, that we have available for smokers. So, as we know, that I think most people know this, is that smoking is the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the United States and that over 500,000, that's over half a million premature deaths per year, are attributed to smoking. At least 18 cancers are attributed to smoking, and smoking accounts for 30% of all cancer deaths. And the cancer that I think most people associate with smoking is lung cancer, and understandably so because um, <clears throat> smoking causes more than 87% of lung cancer cases, um, or actually lung cancer deaths, I should say. And uh, also, six, uh, at least almost two-thirds of all deaths from pulmonary diseases are attributed to smoking. And about a third of all deaths from cardiovascular diseases are caused by smoking. There are some pretty substantial societal costs of smoking. So the total annual costs because of smoking are over $289 billion, and our costs for medical treatment amount to over $132 billion. 
We also lose a lot of productivity every year because of illnesses that smokers are much more likely to get than non-smokers, and that is to the tune of about $157 billion. And let's not forget the cost of secondhand smoke as well. And fortunately, secondhand smoke affects approximately uh, 50% of children between the ages of 3 and 18 years of age. Now, one group that's particularly vulnerable to the negative effects of smoking is cancer patients. And we know that smoking rates are higher in cancer survivors than in the general population. So we have approximately about 14.5 million cancer survivors who are alive today, and that translates to, you know, a lot of smokers, it's, it's, depending on the percentage of cancer survivors who smoke, that translates into a lot of smokers who, um, or a lot of cancer survivors who would be better off not smoking. We do know that about a third of cancer survivors quit within two years of diagnosis. But there is a problem in that after the diagnosis, many cancer survivors may still be smoking. So we conducted a study of about 3,000 long-term cancer survivors and found that even nine years after diagnosis, about 9% were still smoking. And that's over all the different uh, cancer diagnoses. When we looked at individual cancer diagnoses, we found that prevalence varied by cancer type and that bladder cancer uh, survivors uh, were smoking at a rate of 17%. So 17% of, of uh, survivors who had been diagnosed with bladder cancer nine years earlier were still smoking. And the figure is somewhat similar for lung cancer. It's 15%. And we also looked at those survivors who were still smoking to get an idea of how much they were smoking. The majority of them were smoking, that is 83% were smoking every day. And the average number of cigarettes they were smoking on those days was 15%, it was uh, for almost 15 cigarettes per day. About 17% were smoking only on some days, not every day. And those individuals smoked on average about 11 days in the last 30 days. And on those days that they smoked, they smoked an average of almost six cigarettes per day. Now, there was some positive news in those data. So about 47% of those current smokers have said or indicated that they plan to quit in the next six months. Uh, about 43% weren't sure and only about 10% said they definitely don't want to quit. Now, the reasons why smoking and quitting is so important for cancer survivors is that, as the 2014 Surgeon General Report concluded, quitting smoking improves the prognosis of cancer patients. And they also noted that cigarette smoking increases all-cause mortality and cancer-specific mortality, and that particularly for cancer survivors, why this is an issue, is cigarette smoking increases the risk for second primary cancers known to be caused by cigarette smoking, such as lung cancer. And although the evidence wasn't as strong as for the first three points, that the, the data did suggest an association between cigarette smoking and both the risk of recurrence of the original primary cancer, poor response to treatment, and increased treatment-related toxicity. So there was a greater, the data suggested there was a greater likelihood of adverse effects from cancer treatment if, uh, if the patient was still smoking. So we, were, we may wonder, you know, if quitting smoking has so many positive benefits, why would we find a significant, significant number of cancer survivors smoking well after their diagnosis? Well, there are a number of reasons, and these can be divided into patient factors, provider factors, and institutional factors. Patient factors are factors related to the patient uh, himself or herself. Provider factors, I'm referring to things like uh, the role of healthcare practitioners, 
um, whether that be the oncologist or the primary care provider. And institutional factors, I'm referring to things such as clinic procedures, for example, whether smoking status is even asked for routinely in the practice. And so now I'm just going to go over some of these factors, um, uh, categories of factors in a little bit more detail. So patient factors can include things like uh, a patient feeling guilty or feeling stigmatized about smoking, and that might prevent them from seeking support for quitting. And this may be especially the case for uh, cancer survivors or cancer patients who, you know, if it's a smoking-related cancer, may feel particularly guilty that um, they sort of brought this on themselves. So that might be one factor that prevents them from seeking support for quitting. Um, some patients may also feel that they don't know how to go about quitting. They might have very low confidence in their ability to quit um, and just think that they don't know what, what to do or where to go, who to ask uh, for help in quitting. Um, there may also be patients who feel that they don't, that smoking is not a risky behavior for their health. So there may be some cancer patients who feel if they uh, conquered their cancer and, and, and are in remission and it's been five years since their diagnosis, they may feel that, well, I'm continuing to smoke and it's not really harming uh, my health, my cancer has been beaten, um, maybe it's not as risky as um, other people make it out to be. And still probably the most um, important factor for uh, why patients may not be able to just quit is, of course, nicotine addiction and coping with withdrawal symptoms. And just so that we don't underestimate the role of addiction, um, the 1988 report by the Surgeon General concluded that cigarettes and other forms of tobacco are addictive, nicotine is the drug in tobacco that causes addiction, and that the physiological and behavioral processes that determine tobacco addiction are similar to those that determine heroin and cocaine addiction. And in recent years, uh, the tobacco, manu tobacco manufacturers have increased the addictiveness of cigarettes. And so not only does any product containing nicotine have the potential to be addictive, but smoking cigarettes is particularly effective in delivering nicotine, nicotine hence its effectiveness. And in this, in this uh, picture, you can see uh, this Indonesian five- or six-year-old boy uh, was addicted to cigarettes and was smoking uh, at least a pack a day. Now, the good news is that most smokers, the majority, say they want to quit. Unfortunately, though, most try quitting on their own. And when, when they try quitting on their own, their success rate is not as effective as, it is not as high as they say had uh, elicited help for their quit attempt. In fact, only about 1% of smokers succeed in quitting without any help. And for some smokers, it may take several attempts before quitting for good. Um, for some people, it may be up to 15 attempts. Now, why, how can we help smokers uh, in quitting? Well, smokers need help in coping with cravings, which can be triggered by stress or other cues or events and as well as uh, withdrawal symptoms. And some common withdrawal symptoms include uh, feelings of depression, anxiety, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, restlessness, irritability, frustration, anger, uh, increased uh, appetite or weight gain. But these usually subside within eight days to two weeks, but cravings can occur any time. So in having to deal with these symptoms, you can see why it can be hard to quit and why getting help for a quit attempt can be so important and can increase the chances of quitting for good. And that's where healthcare providers can make a difference. But there's still some barriers at the provider level. So doctors, uh, whether they be oncologists or the primary care practitioner, might feel that they don't have enough time to talk about quitting with their patients. They may feel that they are not trained in how to support a quit attempt. They may feel that they don't know enough about medications or what the counseling options are. They may not feel very confident because of that um, in adequately supporting a patient. And there's also the possibility that um, PCPs might feel that the patient is already stressed, especially if this is a cancer patient and has just been diagnosed. 
they're having to deal with the um, with the stressfulness of, of knowing that uh, they've been diagnosed with cancer and so the provider may feel they don't want to add to that stress uh, to the patient by talking about quitting smoking and suggesting that they sort of stop this behavior that they may feel provides some kind of relief or um, stress relief or calming influence on the patient. And then we also, providers might also have beliefs about the patient's, un or patient's unwillingness or inability to quit. But it is important to remember that many patients are motivated to quit and that the cancer diagnosis might be actually a point at which they may be especially motivated to quit and that providers can use that moment to bring up, talk about quitting smoking. In fact, we conducted a study to try to answer the very question about whether a cancer diagnosis provides a really uh, a good uh, event or an event which can be uh, utilized to encourage smoking. So our question was, does a recent cancer diagnosis motivate people to quit smoking. It made sense to us because um, cancer diagnosis is a time that your health is your biggest concern, and we thought that a cancer patient might be especially motivated to do something to improve his or her, her health. And the way to test this would be to compare rates of quitting smoking between individuals who were recently diagnosed with individuals who were not diagnosed. And we thought that this would... Um, the evidence of this would provide support for the idea that a cancer diagnosis might be a teachable moment that providers can use to encourage cessation. So we examined this question using data from a large prospective study, which was the nutrition cohort, which was part of the American Cancer Society's cancer prevention study. And this on the slide is just a timeline of the CPS2 nutrition cohort. So participants filled out a, 19, a survey in 1992 or 1993, and then starting from uh, 1997, every two years, they filled out follow-up surveys that included questions about smoking status and cancer diagnosis and other health behavior-related questions. And what we found was that smokers diagnosed with cancer quit at significantly higher rates compared to smokers who were not diagnosed with cancer. And we found this both two years and four years after their diagnosis. And it didn't matter if the cancer was or was not typically associated with smoking. The threat rates were still uh, higher among those smokers who were recently diagnosed with cancer. So we felt that this was good evidence that a recent cancer diagnosis motivates smoking cessation regardless of the type of cancer, and that it lends support to the idea that uh, a diagnosis can be a teachable moment. And we hope that these results would encourage oncologists or TCPs to, uh, to bring up smoking cessation in all patients who smoke. And we wanted to have this effect because, unfortunately, there's, enough, there's evidence that not enough of that is happening. So for cancers that are not clearly smoking-related, providers might not be bringing up the idea of quitting, even though these patients might be quite receptive to the notion of quitting, quitting smoking. All right, so, so let's say a provider is indeed motivated to, to bring up smoking and to, um, you know, to address smoking and to provide some tools to help the patients quit. While there may also still be institutional factors that need to be addressed that may make, that may make it difficult for providers to assist the patients in quitting smoking. And these could be, for example, just not even assessing tobacco use in electronic health records so that the provider doesn't know whether this, the smoker has been engaged or has been asked about their quit attempt. Um, also, institutions might feel that they don't have enough resources to provide cessation options. And then there's also the issue of reimbursement for uh, providing cessation treatment. And in subsequent sessions of this webinar series, you'll see examples of how these issues can be addressed in efficient and cost-effective manner or in settings in which, you know, there, the resources for providing cessation treatment are limited. But in, in the remaining uh, slides, I'll just review quickly what uh, tobacco treatment may look like um, to give you a sense of, in other words, what, a, of what you know, what what the components of tobacco treatment should generally include. 
Well, one of the most important tools that are available for helping smokers quit are pharmacist therapies. These include nicotine replacement therapies as well as uh, prescription medications like bupropion and varenicline. And nicotine replacement therapies, um, there's not just one. We have the patch, gum, lozenges, nicotine inhaler, nicotine nasal spray. Um, information about these particular NRT therapies um, can be found in the clinical practice guideline um, for quitting smoking. The beauty about NRT is that you can combine them. So a patch will be good for providing a, a stable level of nicotine. Um, but other products can be used to address the cravings in particular situations, like the nicotine inhaler or the nasal spray. And these uh, pharmacotherapies are associated uh, with a 25 to 35 percent quit rate after uh, a six-month follow-up, um, that is, following uh, treatment. And we do know, based on uh, amount of a large body of research that pharmacotherapy and behavioral counseling are more effective than each alone. And there are some very easy options for uh, behavioral counseling, easy in the sense of easy to recommend. And uh, these include the 1-800-QUIT-NOW, which offers free telephone counseling for any smoker. And some states even include free NRT for uh, their uh, residents who, who register for it for the uh, telephone counseling. And these usually involve at least four uh, telephone counseling sessions uh, with a counselor. Um, behavioral counseling can also include referrals to in-person cessation clinics. Um, there are also some good uh, internet resources, such as smokefree.gov, which the National Cancer Institute runs. And on their website, they have um, a listing of free texting programs and some apps that are available for use, like the Quit Guide. Uh, BecomeAnX.org, which is sponsored by the Legacy for Health Foundation, uh, also includes some important, some, some good and important resources. And then there's QuitNet, which is an online community that smokers can access to get the support from other smokers who are uh, involved in quitting. So what does uh, behavioral treatment or counseling involve? Well, the main focus is on helping the smoker problem solve and provide skills training. So what's important or what, what's a, an important component of uh, practical counseling is uh, getting smokers to recognize dangerous situations, sometimes for, you know, by, you know, including a diary of the situations which led them to feel uh, strong craving. Um, so they would need to identify uh, events, internal states, or activities that increase the risk of smoking or relapse, and of course, um, these can include uh, negative aspects and stress, drinking alcohol, um, the availability of cigarettes. Um, treatment also involves helping them develop coping skills in trying to deal with those dangerous situations and to help them gain practice in dealing with these. So learning to anticipate and avoid temptation and trigger situations any cognitive strategies that will reduce negative moods, um, behavioral strategies to cope with smoking urges, for example, distracting one's attention, changing routines, uh, etc. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that basic information about smoking and successful quitting would need to be provided, um, information about when they can expect withdrawal symptoms, the peak, and to subside. Um, informing them about the addictive nature of smoking, which can help to address stigma, you know, why can't I quit? Well, it is an addictive behavior that has had uh, a long time to, to be reinforced. And these uh, common elements of practical counseling that I mentioned here um, appeared in the Clinical Practice Guideline, Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence, um, which was put out by the U.S. Department of Health and Public, uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services Public Health Service. Uh, in May 2008, and I would recommend taking a look at that. It's, it's a treasure trove of information for helping to treat tobacco dependence in the clinical setting. Um, and then I'm just going to end with uh, mentioning a couple of studies that we are conducting here at the American Cancer Society, and we refer to these as e-health interventions for quitting smoking because we think they'll offer the uh, best chance for disseminating um, the effect of tobacco treatment to smokers. And the first one I'll talk about is a study we conducted to test whether sending tailored emails 
smokers before and after their quit date would be an effective way of helping smokers quit. And the second study um, is one that we started up recently uh, that I'll just give a couple of details about. So why study uh, uh, per tailored or personalized emails? Well, emails have the advantage that most smokers access their email accounts on a daily or almost daily basis, so they won't need to go to a specific website as required with computer or web-based interventions. So there's no need to send reminders to encourage participants to repeatedly visit and engage, and engage with a cessation website. And also, emails can provide information and text in the message, including images, which texting programs haven't done um, at this point in time. And emails can also be read on devices other than a computer by smokers who own them. And so in collaboration with our cancer control department, we designed a three-arm randomized control trial to test whether these personalized uh, or tailored emails can actually help smokers quit. And the first two groups, which you see here in the diagram, um, they got personalized emails like personalized tailored emails both before and after their quit date. And I'll show you an example of an email that the smokers in the deluxe email group received. And that's the group that got the most uh, number of emails. The basic email group, um, the middle group here, uh, they received their cessation information via a link that was embedded in the body of each email that led them to booklets that they could then download that had the information on quitting. And then we had a control group that received a single uh, email with links to resources, and that didn't have any of the points. And this is what our email looked like. As you can see, um, the first part addressed the smoker by his or her name. It says, tomorrow is your quit day. Here's some tips to get ready for tomorrow. Um, throw away all your cigarettes. Clean out your ashtray. Try to remove all the reminders of smoking from your room, etc." Keep yourself busy tomorrow, plan your day so you can avoid being in places with smokers. And then at the left bottom uh, corner of the email, it has a synopsis of information that the, that the smoker had provided to us um, in a baseline questionnaire at the beginning of the study. It lists their top reasons for quitting so that they'll always remember that. Um, it had who they're supposed, the person that they said would support them in their quit attempt, and it has their quit date so they can see that every time they have, uh, every time they receive an email. And then on the right-hand side were some links to some quitting resources that they could go to right away. For example, they could click on um, to get information about talking to a quit smoking counselor at the 1-800-QUIT-NOW number. Well, what we found was that the deluxe group, which had the black bars in the uh, diagram, reported on average abstinence that was about 10% higher than the control group. And that was particularly true at the six-month follow-up, where the difference was 37% for the deluxe group versus 27% uh, for the control group. So the implications of this um, study was that we found a very low-cost method of delivering smoking cessation information to smokers. It really cost pennies to send out these emails, um, the cost was basically in setting up the system for the tailoring and the personalization. But once you have that, then it's very easy to uh, get the system going. We do have plans to scale this up and to make it available to smokers visiting cancer.org and to include it in the toolkit that uh, we provide to ACS uh, workplace, uh, to, to employers who come to the ACS Workplace Solutions website to look for um, tools that they can use to help their employees quit smoking. And then I'm just going to quickly mention the second project that we started uh, because it represents a unique approach for an app for quitting. And the basic premise is to use peer mentors uh, who provide support for quitting through texting. And it sort of follows the, um, you know, the way, the, uh, the strategy that Alcoholics Anonymous or um, Older Readers Anonymous uses in getting a sponsor or a mentor to help you through the process of changing your behavior. And we're conducting this in collaboration with NCI's Tobacco Control and Research Branch, um, Alir or Optum, which is our Quick for Life partner, and also colleagues at George Washington University and University of California, San Francisco. And if we're successful, um, Alir will want to incorporate the features we're testing into their app. So 
the fact that we're testing, part of it is automated. It sends automated messages every day, like Smoke Free Text does, but the text will be personalized and it'll appear to come from the mentor. And the smoker will have the opportunity to reply to the mentor and to engage in further discussion about a cessation topic. And the mentor is going to be trained through an online two-hour module. And then if we're uh, successful with this approach, we want to incorporate a gamification component, which refers to using behavioral economic principles to change health behaviors. And gamification comes from the world of video games, which is it uses features to try to get people addicted to video games. For example, like using rewards and competition to make achieving a goal seem more like a game. So maybe we'll have like weekly challenges or points or other rewards for achieving certain levels that increase in difficulty over time. There's been very little research um, in cessation that uses these kinds of features, so we're kind of excited to explore this. So before I end, um, I just want to go over some basic points um, of what, the, what I tried to demonstrate in this, um, in this webinar, and, which, and they include demonstrating that quitting smoking dramatically reduces the risks of cancer, cardiovascular, and other diseases. But many patients still smoke due to addiction and lack of assistance. But you know, we have resources that are available to providers and institutions to help them remove barriers to helping patients quit smoking. Another important point is that there are many interventions that can easily be, rec be recommended that require very little resources on the part of the provider or institution. For example, recommending calling a quit line counseling uh, uh, telephone counseling quit line. And the final point I'd like to make is that research, we do need research to, uh, to learn how to tailor interventions to specific populations that are vulnerable to the effects of smoke. So thank you very much for listening. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Amy. Uh, in case individuals may have uh, some additional questions. Great, thank you. And Rebecca, would you mind um, reminding individuals how they may call into the queue if they prefer to verbally ask their questions? We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star then one on your touchdown phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one. Okay, great. And also, um, feel free to type your questions into the chat box if you have any questions for Dr. Westmont. And Dr. Westmont, while we're waiting, um, could you pass the ball back to me and I'll go through um, these last questions or these last few slides? Okay, somehow um, the... Uh the panel that had the ball disappeared, and it has now. I'm seeing poll questions. So, okay. So how do I get I back? Sure. Click on the um, participant. Oh, there we go. Oh, looks like there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So while we're waiting um, to see if we have any questions, first of all, thank you, Dr. Westmoss. Um, I'm. Um, I was really excited. Are you there? Yes. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> I would say I'm um, actually really eager to hear the results um, of some of the different interventions you all are trying, you know, through the email and the texting and, and the gaming um, the gaming component. It would be really interesting to hear results of that. How long is your pilot um, expected to go? Um, we hope to be finished by the end of this year. Okay, great. Yeah, we're in, right now we're in the process of um, completing the training modules for the mentors and uh, and recruiting mentors for participation in the study. Great. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions in chat. Um, Rebecca, is there anyone on the line? We have no audio questions. Okay. Well, um, I just want to make sure the audience did see um, in the right hand corner of your screen. You should have seen um, evaluation pop up, and as you leave today, if you could quickly go through those, um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, and also, again, I just want to remind you of a couple of our upcoming webinars. Uh, the June 16th um, is coming up right around the corner. You can register by clicking that link in the chat box. And in July, we're hoping to hear from um, you, hear from providers on 
um, you know, successful interventions um, that you've participated in. Um, so certainly if you have um, things you want to share with the group, uh, please reach out to us and you could be our uh, next webinar star. Um, and then finally, again, I want to remind everyone that our uh, recording of the webinar will be available on our online community, which you can access at that link. And if you want to learn more about the HQC initiatives, um, we have a couple contacts here. We have Terry Lindsay as well as Kelly Lonello. Um, so even if you're interested in other initiatives outside the cardiac world, uh, feel free to reach out to us, and we'd be happy to connect you. And if I'll check in one more final time to see if we have any questions. We have no audio questions. Okay. Well, Dr. Westmuth or Kathleen, anything else on your end? Okay. Well, with that, um, we – okay, great. Uh, with that, um, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you have a great um, afternoon and a great Memorial Weekend. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.